making me work for it. Well, good morning. Uh, for those of you who are our regular attendees of this church, I am not Pastor John. Uh, for those of you who are new and may have been here for the first time, I am not Pastor John. Uh, my name is Mike Remersma. I'm just a layman here in the church. No, no, not a lame man, but just a layman. Some of you may think I'm lame, but that's all right. Um, and it, it's um, it, it's it's a privilege for me to to be able to to be up here this morning uh, to talk to you. I, and I take that as a great responsibility, but it's. It's really great to see you all this morning. I'm glad you're here. When John asked me, I mean, it was a couple weeks ago, uh, John asked me, you know, uh, could you preach for me on, on June 3rd? I said, is, is, it, is it really that bad? Is it, has it really gotten to that point? Are you, are you that desperate? And um, he, he, he tried to encourage me that, no, it, that, that wasn't the reason. But, but uh, it, it just, I just want to give you hope that if this is something that you want to do, they, they, they pretty much take almost anybody. Okay. <laughs> So John has started last week this sermon series on, on Design to Connect. If, if you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to go back on Facebook and, and um, listen to the sermon from last week. It was, he did a really nice job, and I just want to recap a little bit of that sermon for you uh, as we progress into this week. So last week he talked about God's design to us to connect with others. He talked in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And as we look at Genesis 1 and 2, it's really, you think about how God designed things, it was, and it was perfect, right? It was perfect, Genesis 1 and 2. He talked about how God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are completely separate individuals, but yet all one at the same time, and it's like, just explodes your mind, because how is that even possible? We don't understand that, but that's the way it is. God made us in, in his image, all right? Talked about, he made, he made all these creations, and it was good, right? Those, all, those, all the things that he created, the, 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 the moon, the stars, the plants, the animals, and it was good. Ah, but then he made man, and it was very good. But there was this thing that, you know, man was there, and he was in the garden, and God was, said, you know, you're lonely. You know, there wasn't anybody for him. So he puts him asleep, takes a rib out of his, out of his side, and creates woman, right? So he got the two of them in the, in the garden, and it's perfect. This is how it was supposed to be. Perfect communion with God perfect communion with a companion. They were all connected. It was a perfect connection. Oh, and then we get into chapter 3. And Satan comes into the picture. And he's like, oh, hey, did he tell you not to eat of these things? You know? No, if you ate that, oh, you'll, be, you, you'll know. You, you'll know everything that he knows. You'll know things. And it was true. They, they, they figured it out. So, you know, Eve takes a bite of the apple, and, and, and she's there. And, and this is what I love, right? And it says, Adam was standing there with her. Oh, hey, way to, way to lead your house there, buddy. Nice job. Hey, grow a spine, you moron. Good grief, you know. I mean, that's, that, so, so then we, you know what happened? We screwed it up. So then you had sin, and sin entered the world, and there you go. There's the disconnection. That's where it all happened. That's where it all began. So that's why Satan is there, always wanting us disconnected. And so that's why John, in the last point he had, was that this disconnection, that's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual problem because we sin. And so today, I want us to look at uh, I got a video for us here, and I want us, you know, when we go to church, we're looking for that 
perfect utopia, what we have in our mind of what that is. And I want you to see here what it's like to, to shop for a church. Previously on Church Hunters. This is your first church. This is Creekside First Baptist. Honestly, right up front, uh, didn't love the name. The Sunday morning experience was just a little too traditional. Hey guys, how we doing? Hey, good. Doing how are good, you? doing good. So I know you didn't love the traditional vibe of the last place, okay? Mm -hmm. okay. But I think this church is really going to do it for you. Yeah. It takes relevance to a whole new level. Behind me, you will see molded clay, jar art, tapestry, canvas, mosaic wow. church. Mm, I love beautiful. it. Right? So you've heard of interdenominational. Mm -hmm. Right. And you've heard of non-denominational. Mm -hmm. Well, this church identifies as interdenominational. Wow. Wow, that's, that's perfect for it. us. It really is. But here's the kicker. A lot of celebrities go here. Yeah. What? Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> we love him. Yep. We really do. Ben Higgins from ABC's The Bachelor. <laughs> perfect. Several Real Housewives. Ooh. Wow. And... Usher even came here one time. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, well, follow me. Come on. Let's do it. So refreshing. Honestly, that last church was just way too traditional. It was yeah. too much. It was like we left there feeling convicted. Like, uh, ugh, right? Right. We're just, we're looking for more of a Tony Robbins type sermon. Like inspiration, like a TED Talk with a Bible verse. Yes. Oh, yes. Right? It's perfect here. We love it. It really is. We love it. Awesome. Cool. Well, you guys know a lot of contemporary pastors speak out of the Message Translation Bible. Mm -hmm. Right. Or this pastor speaks out of a brand new translation. It's the Tumblr Bible. Oh, Shut we love Tumblr, up. though. This is great. Wow. A lot of emojis, a lot of abbreviations. Oh, I couldn't ask for one. And how many seats in here? Oh, it is 6,000 altogether. They have 6,000. Wow. i got to be in this worship band. That's Imagine true. me up on that jumbotron mid guitar solo. Do you know how many Instagram likes you get? Oh. oh my gosh. We find it hard to find a church right now because I grew up Catholic. I grew up and Baptist. So So like we we drink. Yeah, but just in private. I mean, obviously you get it. Basically in terms of like worship, I think we're looking for like a Jesus culture type feel. Oh, I right. love them. At Hillsong, obviously. Oh, so you do the cross? Hillsong's great. Like a Bethel minus the spontaneous yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Just for me, I connect in worship more when the leader is attractive. Personally, I'm a Carrie Job guy. Oh, okay. Well, she's married. Um, so is Christian Stanfield. Wow. <laughs> so one of my personal favorite things about this church is the service times. Okay. There's an 8.30, a 10, a 1 o'clock, a 5.30, and even a 7 o'clock service. Oh, there's something around like 2-ish? Yeah, for us, for what we need, 2, 2.15 is best. Yes. Uh, how many songs do they do during worship? Usually five, five and a half, depending on where the spirit leads. Oh, wow, babe, is that is that a lot? Well, if that's too much that for you, they have a program here called the Worship Assist Program. Okay. So if you ever get tired during worship, an intern will come out and just hold your arms up. You just keep worshiping the King of Glory. Just like that. Wow. I love it. Oh, you can still look super spiritual. Huh? And my arms get so tired from yoga. Oh, same. I actually like this church. I think we can make it work. It was all right. I mean, it was it was good. But pers like, I emailed the pastor, and he didn't immediately respond. So uh, we're taking these vessels elsewhere. Uh huh. You know that that's some of you. You know, for some of us, that's our approach to church. We live in a consumer-driven society that tells us it's all about us. How in the world can we feel connected to others when our focus is so much on ourselves? We're more concerned with what we can get out of church than what we can give and how we can serve. Why, why does that happen? Well, we talked about it earlier. It's because of sin. We're all sinners who are fallen and deserve hell. That's the reality. That's where we are. It's what we deserve. We need to understand that. But there's a way out. Every second of every day, we're in a constant internal battle to do the right thing. We are in a constant tug of war between our sin nature and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
Every decision we make, Satan wants us over here. Come on, come on, come on. Nope, and then the Holy Spirit drives us back over here. Nope, we're going to come on. Nope, and then we're going to make this decision work over here. Every second of every day, it's back and forth, and it's a battle, and that's what we're in. And it's because of sin. But God designed us to live in paradise and worship Him without sin. He gave us a way to be at peace with Him and also with ourselves. He designed us to connect. That's the way it was in the beginning. Before we screwed it up, it was perfect. That's how He designed us, to connect with Him and with others. And He gave us a plan on how to do it. I ran across this definition of Brene Brown. She is a... uh, uh, a, a researcher, a storyteller, um, uh, uh, motivational speaker. She says, I define connection as the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued. When they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship." We talk about relationships. And John talked a little bit about it last week. And Dave Brassus isn't here this week, but I mean these things are pretty cool. I mean you got you got these bo- they actually connect, you know, you got them here. So but a lot of us are a lot more readily available. We want connections, right? Some of us, like myself, I'm kind of I, I'm I'm really okay kind of being by myself. You know, to be perfectly honest, see, my family's laughing because they know. I can be by myself. I'm very comfortable being by myself. I can do my own things. Then I look at this. This is my wife right here. (laughs) Okay? You know, everybody loves her. Got friends all over the place. She's, she's, that's, that's, that's her wheelhouse there. Get connected. Connecting with everybody. But at some point, for even for those of us who are really comfortable being by ourselves, at some point, we need to be connected with others. So, what are we going to do? What in the world is the plan? Well, here's the plan. The church is God's best plan for connections. We're going to look, I want to take a look in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, real quick. Genesis 3, 15. After we had messed it all up, in verse 15, he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He's going to put Christ right in there. John 3.16, that, John, uh, Genesis 3.15, that was God's reply. The reply to that, to that sin was, I'm going to put Christ in there. At some point, there you go. He's going to be, the med- He's going to be in there, in between. Satan and us. John 3.16, a lot of us know that. God's gift. God to love the world, He gave His Son. And whoever, whoever believeth in Him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the plan. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which will be a lot of the bulk of, of um, where we'll be today in verses 12 through 27, it, is, it talks about unity, unity and diversity in the body, and we'll get to that in, in just a second. But the Christian life, especially when it comes to being part of a church community, it's full of discomfort and awkwardness. But God uses these challenges to help us know Him better. How many, how many times have, have you grown in your spiritual life because of adversity? Because things aren't always going perfect in your life. A lot of us, though, that's, that's where, in, 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 in all fairness, you know, that's probably where we are most at ease and we're most at comfort with our relationship with God because we're going through it and we don't know where to go, we don't know where to turn, and that's where we go. 
and that's great. When it's all going all well and good, we think everything is going good, we're trying to do it on ourselves, we don't feel as close and we're not as connected with God. Rather than attempting to find our dream church, okay, we must embrace the uncomfortable and difficult parts of the Christian life in order to grow and experience true community. We all have people in our churches. Shoot, we have people in our lives every day that rub us the wrong way. People that we try to avoid when we see them coming down the hall. You know it's true. The body of Christ is made up of people from all backgrounds and all walks of life. And sometimes that makes living in community difficult. I would love it if everyone were thinking the same as what I did and had the same viewpoints as I did. That would be great for, for a little while, but then that would, that would get old and I wouldn't grow. So the easy thing is to quit. Walk away. Keep searching. Keep church hunting for that perfect church that doesn't exist. So we need to get back to God's perfect design. I want to briefly, if if you go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, Am I, am I supposed to give out the obligatory, oh, it's great to hear those pages rustling? Right? Every pastor does, right? Just mock pastors there for a second. My dad was a pastor. That was fine. He, can, he understands that. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, it starts, and it goes roughly through chapter 5, verses 20, verse 21. But in, in, in verses uh, 1 through 6, Paul talks about, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have and walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all loneliness and gentleness and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Talks, talking about unity. Then he goes on in verse 17, uh, in verse 7, excuse me, in verse 7 through 16, talking about spiritual gifts. Then he goes on in, uh, in chapter 4, and, uh, and we'll go down to um, verse 20, 22 to 24. that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which are, are, that's our sin, our sin nature, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. Verse 25 to 30, talking about uh, not grieving the Holy Spirit, Therefore, put away lying. Each one speaks the truth with a neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole, who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is, what is good, that he may have something to give who has need. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. This is a present tense. This is continual. This is at this moment. Don't do that. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. Let bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And then in, ver- in chapter 5, verses 1 through 21, we won't 
go all through them. He talks about walking in love, walking in the light, walking in wisdom. This is the plan. Right? It's laid out there. It's right there for us. But some reason we don't want to listen. Romans 8, 28, 29. Go over there with me. Many of you know this verse, these verses, okay? But it talks about conforming to the image of His Son. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's the plan. We've been going through, uh, I, I've been facilitating a, a Bible hour class, and um, it's called uh, uh, For the Life of the World, Letters to the Exiles, and it talks about that this is not our home. Where, where we are right now, where we are living is not our home. We're just uh, exiles basically, in this world. And we're, we're really just passing through. Uh, that our, our position right now is in heaven. Um, I want to read a verse to you. Um, Ephesians 2.6. You don't have to turn there, but... Um, ha- how many of you have ever... Have, have you ever written or seen a letter... Uh, someone writes to you and they, at the bottom of the letter they see, you know, keep looking up and then they sign their name, you know, it's like keep looking up, right? Yeah. My dad always wrote keep looking down in, in, in his letters. Keep looking down, keep looking down. When I was a young kid, I remember asking him, Dad, what in the world are you talking about? What, am I looking to hell or what are we talking? You know, everyone else says keep looking up toward heaven, right? He said, well, I want, look at this verse, Ephesians 2, 6. And it says, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. Our position is there. We're already positionally in heaven. And so he was saying, I'm not from here. I'm just passing through. I'm I'm looking down because that's where my home is. Um, Titus 3, 1 through 8, John talked about it a little bit uh, last week. Again, solidifying the plan of what this should look like. So as we talk about this plan, we talk about this perfect design that God has for us, I wanted to take a look at a few observations that I think might help us in this process of figuring out what we can do to become better members of the body of Christ as well as within our local church. Observation number one. Everyone is welcome and has a part to play in the body of Christ. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 12, and we're going to look at this. We're going to look at unity in the body. And I'm just going to read this, all right? So bear with me. And I'm reading out of the New King James, by the way, in case you all were wondering. Not because it's any, any better or worse than any other translation, but because that's what I grew up with, and so that's what I'm preaching out of, so deal with it. For as, many, for, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit you were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact the body is not one member but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if an ear should say, because I am not an eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? 
But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have great modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members, individuals. Paul uses this metaphor of the body to describe the church. A body is made up of many different parts. Foot, hand, ear, eye, nose. Each part has a unique purpose. Every part belongs to the body, and without that part, the body is no longer a whole. It's the same thing with the church. It's easy to look at the praise band, or Pastor John, or the board, or Bible hour teachers, or greeters, or whoever, and assume that these are the important people in our church. But in fact, like it says in verse 13, whether we're Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, that plays a crucial role in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is where we should be able to be ourselves. To be accepted and feel connected. John talked a little bit about these Legos. Now, I look at this and I see this is the body, right? There's so many members, so many parts. What can we do with that? Well, we can do great things with it if we use it right. I mean, this this has, you know, I I don't know, 400,000 pieces or something like that, uh, I think that he referenced last week. But, But the complexity... It's unbelievable what can be done if it's done correctly. Together, our unique shape can complement each other and create a more structurally sound design. We all have more connections. Some have more connections than others. You know, we got my wife here, you know, but then we got me here. These don't have things on the bottom. But... If it did, it would connect. But that's how it's designed. That's how we are designed. The question we should ask when we're thinking about our church community is not, does the community hit all of my check boxes and my preferences and my desires for what I need in a church? But rather, is this a place that I can faithfully serve the community and be a committed part of this body. Observation two. Being part of the church is really hard. You're probably all familiar with the saying, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. Well, you're all family. We're all family. If you're a believer, we're all family. So, sorry people, you're stuck with me. Do any of you have that awkward relative that, that, that drives everyone else in your family crazy? Right? Okay, my family and I, we love National... Uh, at Christmas time, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation is one of our all-time favorite Christmas movies. And if you're familiar with that, you know Cousin Eddie? Right? Okay? The guy is an absolute moron. And it, it's just hilarious. But... He's kind of the butt of all their uh, butt of all their jokes, and but we all have that. Well, the body of Christ is your family, and we have family members all over the world, and sometimes we don't always get along. Paul emphasizes that 
All who are baptized are part of one body, even Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. Another way to, to, to read this verse is to say, for we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body regardless of our background, our nationality, our social status, our political beliefs, or any other arbitrary dividing line that doesn't matter in God's design. The reality is living in community with people, especially people different than ourselves, is really, really hard. There are disagreements, uncomfortable moments, awkward silences, and plenty of frustrations. It can be tempting to just leave and find a place that we feel is more within our comfort zone. That's what we do. That's everything that we're told today. If it doesn't fit you, if it doesn't make sense to you, go find somewhere else. Heaven forbid you do the hard work and stick it out and make it work. Why do you think there's so many divorces now? Because it's easy. That's the easy thing. It's a lot more difficult to to realize that you have a problem. That problem may be me. And to deal with it. That's hard. That's difficult. And we need to understand that. Generally speaking, when it comes to the daily challenges and discomfort, the Bible doesn't give us an option to leave. That's not an option. Brett McCracken in his book Uncomfortable says, quote, the tension of a diverse conglomeration of people coming together in Christ's name will often be combustible, but it's also at the heart of the gospel. We're supposed to challenge each other. We're supposed to call people out in love, like we talked about earlier. That's what it's about. That's our responsibility. If we see a brother or a sister struggling in sin and we do nothing, shame on us. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And Galatians 6, 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. That's in the Bible. That's what we're supposed to do. And it it does matter how we do it. And we do need to be careful not to fall into that ourselves. But we need to help each other out. As I say, can you just help a brother out? Right? Charles Spurgeon said this about the church. And it's a lengthy quote, but I thought it was really good. The church is faulty. But that is no excuse for you not joining it if you are the Lord's. Nor need your own faults keep you back. For the church is not an institution for perfect people, but a sanctuary for sinners saved by grace, who, though they are saved, are sinners still and need all the help they can derive from the sympathy and guidance of their fellow believers. The church is the nursery for God's weak children, where they are nourished and grow strong. It is the fold for Christ's sheep, the home for Christ's family. Rather 
been searching for a church full of people who look and think and act and believe like us. We must realize that church doesn't exist. That church is not out there because every church is full of sinners saved by the grace of God. And even if it did exist, it wouldn't be the church that we need. Embracing the tension and the struggle of being part of a church community teaches us how to love others, love God, and be a better family member of the body of Christ. Third observation is although we are different, we're united in the most important way, through the Holy Spirit. The church is not made up of a motley crew of people who just so happen to enjoy getting together for a worship service once a week and meet in their discipleship groups during the week. No, the uniting factor, the thing that brings the church together week in and week out, despite our differences and conflict, is the Holy Spirit. And Paul talked about that in verse 13. For we For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. The church is made up of people who have all experienced something life-changing. The church, the big C, the body of Christ. We've all experienced the same thing, and that's salvation by the grace of God and the filling of the Holy Spirit. We've experienced something life-changing, repentance from sin and grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. We deserved hell. But instead, we showed mercy. As a result, this has bound us together with a bond that calls us to overcome every difference and dividing line. A bond that challenges each of us to yield our own preferences and comfort for the sake of our brothers and sisters. That doesn't mean that all churches have to look alike or worship alike. But Paul is reminding us that in the Spirit, all Christians are united as one. It is easy to forget, but the church is made up of people who have the most important thing in common, the forgiveness of sins and our love for Jesus Christ. Because of the work God has done in all of our lives, we can embrace the uncomfortableness and live in communion with people with whom we may not naturally connect. There are some of you who I connect with at a great level, and it's very easy for me, And there are some of you who I struggle with because I I struggle to find that common ground. But I want to challenge you with this. There is common ground if you are a Christian because we have the Holy Spirit within us. McCracken said this about the discomfort in the church as a means of grace with redemptive purpose. He said, but we are aliens together. We're exiles. We're aliens together. Sovereignly placed together as residents in our community for such a time as this. We are stones being chiseled and smoothed and refined together, and it is painful. But the house the Spirit is building through us is a beautiful thing. We're built to connect. That's what we were designed to do. Designed to have fellowship with God. Perfect fellowship with God. That's the way it was in the beginning. Fortunately for us, He gave us a way to reconnect with Him through His Son and the Holy Spirit.
So, how are you connected here at Frontline? You're connected because you're all members of the body of Christ. And as such, you have a responsibility to serve your brothers and sisters in this family. That's our responsibility. Next week, John's going to talk more specifics about us individually and how we can get connected within our our church. But I want to leave you with this homework. This is my homework assignment for you. How can you adjust your definition of connection to accomplish his purpose and not your own self-interest? How willing are you every week to be part of this family and sacrifice your own agenda for the betterment of other people? You want to see a church that's connected? Let's do that. How much of us are how are how much are we willing to understand and to remember that we sin, and because of that sin, we make bad decisions. But you know what? I'm going to set that aside because my brothers and sisters need me. What a great and far better place this church would be if we would remember God's perfect design and His plan for our church. I'd like to ask the band to come up and we'll close in prayer. Father, why don't you stand with us? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together this morning, uh, to come together as a family, understanding that we all have issues. We all come with baggage. We're all sinners saved by grace. So as we continue to move forward, may we understand and may we truly remember the perfect plan that you had originally placed in the Garden of Eden, that perfect connection, that we understand that we, are, we have been designed to connect, to connect with you and to connect with others. May we become a church that is less interested in our own agenda and self-interest, but the interests of others. May we truly have hearts to serve you and to serve those around us. I pray for the board as they finish their retreat this morning and heading back. pray that they had a great weekend of connecting with each other, of laying out the vision that they have for the next year for this church. Pray for safe travels for them to come back. Dismiss us all with your blessing. We pray this in your name. Amen.